When Doug Estes and Jim Bennett were shot and killed out in the Fulton game area, both of them had been out there hunting and both had been armed, but only one gun was found at the crime scene. Although Jim Bennett's old black powder rifle was lying not far from the bodies, Doug Estes's Mossberg 12-gauge shotgun could not be located. It didn't remain missing for long, though. Two days after the murders, Jeff Titus called to report that he'd found a shotgun in the game area, not far from the crime scene. He told the police that he spotted it when he went back near the game area to check his own traps. I wish I would never have gone back there, because that just started everything. Because I found a gun that they couldn't find, and I found it, and then all of a sudden now that makes me a suspect. And like I say, I've offered to take polygraphs, truth serum, hypnosis, anything. Back in December 1990, just a couple weeks after he found the shotgun, Jeff had in fact taken a polygraph test. I have a copy of your polygraph here. So I, if you don't mind, I'm going to read you a couple of them. Okay. 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 Um, do you know for sure who shot either of those men at Fulton November 17th? No. Before the police picked up that shotgun, did you move it in any way? No. Regarding that shotgun, did you handle it in any way before no. the police were called? No. Um, and the last one was, have you now told me the complete truth about those shootings November 17th to the best of your knowledge? Yes. And then this is the conclusion. After careful analysis of the subject's polygrams, it is in the opinion of the undersigned that the subject was truthful in the relevant issues for which he was being tested. Right. Then I was. That Jeff Titus passed the polygraph isn't meaningful evidence that he's innocent. Polygraphs, as most of us know, are not admissible in court and for good reason. But to the cold case detectives who began working the case in 2000, the fact that Jeff passed a polygraph test did prove something important. It proved he was a sociopath who was able to lie and kill without remorse. For the original detectives on the case, though, who first worked the case in 1990, there was another explanation for why Jeff had been able to find the missing shotgun. As I said before, Jeff Titus knows that land because he hunts and traps it. He notices if there's anything unusual. Just because he found a gun, that doesn't lead me in any way, shape, or form to believe that he is guilty of a homicide. Welcome to Undisclosed. This is episode four of our series of the State vs. Jeff Titus. My name is Rabia Chaudhry. I'm an attorney and author of the New York Times bestseller, A Non-Story, and I'm here with my colleagues, Susan Simpson and Colin Miller. Hi, this is Susan Simpson. I'm an attorney in Washington, D.C., and I blog at The View from LL2. Hi, this is Colin Miller. I'm an associate dean and professor at the University of South Carolina School of Law, and I blog at Evidence Prof Blog. According to the prosecution's theory in this case, the reason that finding the shotgun makes Jeff Titus guilty of murder is that there's no way he actually found the shotgun where he says he did. The police had already searched that area the day before, on Sunday morning, the day after the murders. The shotgun hadn't been there. Which means for Jeff Titus to have found the gun there on Monday, someone had to have taken the shotgun away from the game area before the police arrived, and then brought it back after the search was over. It also means that if Jeff Titus is guilty of killing Jim Bennett and Doug Estes, it wasn't enough for him just to get away with murder. 
He had also needed to flaunt the fact that he'd gotten away with it, by returning the victim's gun and then pretending to have found it. That's the prosecution's theory about what happened, anyway. But for the shotgun to be proof of Jatias' guilt, there has to be a really good reason to think that the shotgun really hadn't been there in the game area, that the police really hadn't found it. So how thorough had their search been, anyway? By the time the police arrived at the Fulton game area on the night of the murders, it had already turned dark. Not yet pitch black, but close enough to make no difference, especially back in the woods. The only reason anyone was able to see anything that night was thanks to the local fire department, who had brought in lights and a generator to illuminate the scene. Deputy Russ Richards was one of the first deputies to arrive at the scene that night, but it wasn't long before over a dozen other law enforcement officers joined them there. Then, like I said, everybody, you know, the rest of the, you know, detectives, crime scene people, command officers, everybody shows up at the scene. Um, bring out the 30 van, big lights, everything else, to light everything up. The lights put up by the fire department were bright, but still, there's only so much light you can do in a dark forest at nighttime, and unfortunately, the crime scene photographs in this case reflect that. Most of the photos are extreme close-ups of individual pieces of evidence, and the few shots of the broader scene are blurry and dark, making it difficult to get a real sense of how the scene was found. Detective Roy Ballot had not been in town that weekend, and so he had not been at the crime scene, but in hindsight he thinks the decision to move ahead and process the crime scene that same night had been a mistake. As cruel as it sounds, probably the best thing that should have been done at that time, which was well after dark when this was investigated would have been to just simply lock off the scene and wait until the following morning for daylight when people could be looking around for any evidence that might have been around. Aside from Bobby Brown and Mark Perry, who'd been out hunting with Doug that day and found the bodies, the only known person to have seen the bodies while it was still daylight is Ron Elwell. Mark Perry had to run to Ron for help and brought him back to the crime scene. And the fact that this was a crime scene and not a hunting accident had quickly become apparent. It was obvious they were both hit in the back. I mean, you can't shoot each other in the back. I mean, that was pretty evident. So. Didn't you say it looked like the one guy was trying to crawl under the lock? Yeah, because, um, uh, I forgot the name, Doug. Doug, I guess. He was underneath a, a log. Like he was, to me, I mean, that's what it looked like. Like he was trying to get away. The victim who had fallen among the logs was Doug Estes, though how exactly his body had been positioned there is a little unclear. Most of the witnesses describe him as having been partially under a log, as if he'd pitched forward and fallen so that he slid under a log that was raised a little above the forest floor. And some who were at the crime scene recall that Doug may have been over some of the other logs as well, as if he'd been running, trying to get away when he was shot, and had pitched forward over them. In crime scene photos, Jim Bennett, the second victim, is shown laying on his back. But that's not how he was positioned when Ron Elwell first saw him. He'd been turned over later, likely by the ambulance team. No, i never seen his face. Ron Elwell does not remember if he saw any weapons near the bodies. There was one thing in particular about the scene, though, that immediately stood out to him. Well, I, rem- I remember distinctly, though, they, that... Uh there was business cards strewn everywhere. Like the shot it must have blew with something right out of his pocket or his wallet or something, I don't remember. From the crime scene photos, it seems like they're scattered quite a ways. They were, they were, they were blowed all over the place. And there was, a, there was quite a few of them. Ron Elwell's first impression had been that whoever shot Jim Bennett had somehow managed to shoot through his wallet as well, causing its contents to scatter around. That wasn't what happened, though. Bennett's wallet hadn't been shot out. Someone had taken it out of his pants pocket, pulled out the contents, and scattered them around. The now empty wallet had then been tossed aside a little ways further still, deeper into the brush. There was never an inventory taken of the wallet contents, so we don't know exactly what all was there. But some of the cards were visible in the crime scene photos, and a few others are described in the crime lab paperwork that documents the fingerprints found on them. And from that, we know that Bennett had been carrying a bank card, a personal lawyer network card, a community college ID, 
assorted business cards for local businesses, and other things like that. There was no money found, though, which was strange. According to Bennett's girlfriend, Kimber, Bennett had been carrying a good deal of cash in him that day. Did you think that maybe that proved it was a potential robbery, that his wallet? Well, that was a possibility, another possibility. Because all we knew was that his wallet was out, papers were strewn, cards... Given the Carhartt-style overalls that Doug Estes had been wearing, it would have been very difficult for anyone to get access to his wallet, and it probably would have been impossible for them to do so without first moving him out of the logs he'd fallen in, and there was no indication that anyone had tried. But with the way that Bennett's wallet had been removed, with the cash taken and the rest of the contents tossed aside, it certainly made it look as if, in addition to the murders, there might have also been a robbery. And to some investigators, like Deputy Russ Richards, That was the whole point, to make it look like a robbery. It was the poorest robbery I'd ever seen because you could see that they had just taken the wallet, taken business cards and stuff out of and just tossed them in all directions. You know, you're just going to throw it straight down. You you know, you're not going to take the time to stage it off. A number of other officers that I spoke to had felt the same way as Deputy Richards. They thought the evidence that this had been a robbery had been, well, simply trying too hard. Not all the investigators thought the crime scene had been staged, though. Cold case team detective Mike Brown has his own theory about why the contents of Bennett's wallet have been scattered around the crime scene. So why do you think Titus uh, would have pulled out the the guy's wallet? Find out who the hell they are. Why why wouldn't he? Why would he care? He's He's a trophy hunter. Okay. Watch no. He wants to know who he killed. Do you think he robbed them? Or robbed no. one of them? You don't think no. so? No, no, no. But, but Bennett did. had some cash. Bennett did have money. And it's gone. Yeah. No, I don't think he... Uh, I don't think he'd rob them. But the, what happened to the money that Bennett had? Hell, I don't know. That Jim Bennett's wallet had been removed, but Doug Estes' wallet had not, was one difference in how the victims were found at the crime scene. And there was another difference, too, between the victims that could potentially have important implications for the case. Both of them were shot with shotgun. One with a slug, which is a large projectile out of a 12-gauge shotgun, probably about that big around, at the size of a 12-gauge barrel, and possibly about that long. That's a solid piece of lead going right through your body. Bennett was shot with buckshot. The only thing you can use those particular rounds in is a shotgun. It's too large for a rifle. The projectile would be much smaller and much more velocity behind it. So if you have two victims that were shot within seconds of one another, but who were shot with different kinds of ammunition, that's kind of a big deal, right? That means they were shot with two different guns, fired by two different shooters. Well, not so fast. As Detective Roy Ballard explained, there's another possible explanation. In the old times, it used to be people would load their shotgun, first shot with a slug, second with bug shot so that if they missed with the slug or wounded it perhaps, the buckshot would spread and perhaps, it's like uh, about a dozen pellets about the size of a ball bearing, small ball bearing. And those would spread out so you would have a wider range of hitting something. So sure, the fact that one of the victims was shot with a slug and the other with buckshot could mean that there were two shooters, or it could just mean that there had been a single shooter who loaded his shotgun in an old school way. So did you consider maybe there were, it could be one person or it could have been two shooters? Could have been. I I just assume because of the proximity to the shots, boom, boom. That's about the time it takes to shoot, rack one back, point, and shoot a second time. I don't believe there was a second shooter, but there could have been. Now, 
Not all detectives who have looked at the case have reached the same tentative conclusion that Roy Ballot did, though. Here's Detective Madison, who investigated the case as part of the cold case team. And my theory has always been there had to be two shooters. Because you got two guys facing away from the shooter. Whoever got shot first, you know, they're shot directly or maybe offset just a, you know, tiny bit from the... Basically straight in the back. Straight in the back, straight through, front to back. You know, blew out their sternums and stuff like that. The body position seemed strange. I could, I could see how you could have two people shot in the back. Like, I could see that scenario happening in some way, but the way they fell, the one person in the middle couldn't have done it. Like, right, exactly. Based on the way the bodies are positioned in the crime scene photos and the hand-drawn crime scene diagrams, I have to agree with Detective Madison. For the victims to have been shot where they fell, I struggle to understand how one person could have been in the position to fire both shots in the time the shooter had available. Doug Estes had to have been shot by someone standing to the south of where Jim Bennett fell, and Jim Bennett had to have been shot by someone to the west and north of where he was. It just doesn't add up in a way that makes one shooter possible. Of course, that only holds true if you assume that the bodies had fallen in the same place where the police found them. And here, that can't be assumed, because we know for a fact that they weren't. Both Estes and Bennett had been rolled over onto their backs before investigators arrived with their cameras to document the scene. Which means that there's too much uncertainty here to really say, one way or the other, if it would have been possible for a single person to have shot both victims. The investigators have theories, but... There's no way to prove any of it. So two types of projectiles were used to kill the victims, which may or may not mean they had been killed by two different weapons. But ammunition aside, both victims were otherwise shot under very similar circumstances. It was close range. From what I recall, it was within five, six feet. So not necessarily you'd have to be a good marksman from that. That's pretty close range. Absolutely not with a shotgun. Yeah, you're good. Yep. Could be anybody with a shotgun. The medical examiner who performed the autopsy in this case made the determination that the victims had been shot from a relatively short range, though the weapon had not been in contact with the victims when it was fired. Bennett had been shot from a distance of approximately four to five feet while Estes had been shot by someone who was no more than eight feet away. Both men had been shot in the same place. At that period of time, you had to have what was called a a license tag, a back tag. And it was customary to pin your deer license in a plastic back tag that would be basically just about between your shoulder blades. That's pretty much where everybody wore it. It's, uh, It's almost like there was a bullseye there and whoever it was aimed for that license tag. In closing arguments at Jeff Titus' trial, the prosecutor stressed how Titus, the expert marksman, had killed Bennett and Estes by shooting them, quote, through the hunting tag dead center. And by shooting the victims in their back tags, the prosecutor told the jury, Titus hadn't just been committing murder. He'd been making a statement. Mike Brown, the cold case team detective, agrees with this interpretation of the evidence. We was marching him over there, and he shot him in the back, in the target. In the target you wear on your back. Yeah, the, the tag. Yeah, he shot him in that. At that time, Bennett comes up, sees what's going on. He turns around and starts to run, and Titus shoots him in the tag. So... He shoots both of them in the tank, which is uh, sending a message. That's sending a message. This thing about both Doug Estes and Jim Bennett having been shot through the center of their back tags is something that comes up again and again in this case. It was repeated several times at trial, and I've heard it many times in interviews with investigators, both from the cold case team and the original detectives. When I got a chance to go into the sheriff's department and review the physical evidence there, I was so startled when Jim Bennett's back tag was pulled out of the box and shown to me. From Rob Bennett? Dog. Yeah, it should be yellow. So there's the tag. Wait, oh, the tag was shot. 
Do you see the shape of the hole in it? There's some tiny little holes in the plastic, but they don't seem to go all the way through. I'm guessing that these are old ones as well. Maybe he just puts the new one in in the top each year. Yeah, but you're supposed to be shot through the tag. I don't see any shots through that tag. If I stared really hard, I could see some crinkling on the edges of the plastic tag holder that had been pinned a bit in its back. So maybe it had been hit. Though, I had trouble convincing myself that that crinkling had really been damaged caused by a gun. And for that matter, although the edge of Doug Estes' plastic tag holder had been unquestionably shot, the damage there was limited to a thin strip along the upper corner. The back tag itself, like with Bennett's, hadn't been touched. It certainly did not appear to be anyway the work of any marksman who was aiming for the back tags. So if Detective Mike Brown is right, and the way the victims were shot had been a message, I have no idea what the message sender could have been trying to say. The search for the missing shotgun had begun that night at the crime scene, as soon as the investigators had realized that Doug Estes's weapon couldn't be located. Finding the gun would be important. Finding the missing gun. It would be important, to, number one, to show that that wasn't the weapon used, which in that case, if it had been, it would have been taken from Estes in some manner but it was found fully loaded. That night, there had been no shortage of officers at the scene, and some who are familiar with this case are skeptical that the shotgun would not have been found right away, had it really been there. Bill Paul Matier, who had been with the group of five hunters from Parchment that drove over to the parking area near the crime scene after hearing Bobby Brown's cries for help, is one of them. He remembered the woods were crawling with police officers that night, and the whole area had been lit up like a stadium. You know, the other thing that I found weird was how far back it was. And they took back lights, you know, the the things they could crank up. And they had that lit up back there where we could see from the road. Lit up, and they didn't find the guns till the next day or so. Day and a half. There's no way. Really? Why do you say that? There's no way they would not have missed those guns. As many police officers, as many people that were out there, as much light as they had, there's no way they would have missed those guns. It's true there were a ton of law enforcement officials out there that night, and by all accounts, the lighting they'd brought was pretty intense. But even though the public game area on the east side of Bear Creek is a relatively small area, it's still a forest and trying to search a forest at night for something the size of a shotgun isn't going to be an easy task, especially when that forest is also full of swamp and sinkholes. When I spoke to Deputy Thomas Harmson, who was the crime scene specialist who'd drawn the diagrams of where evidence had been found, I'd shown him a map I'd made which had his diagrams overlaid into a larger map of the Fulton State game area. And when I did, he noticed that my map had a marker on the spot where Titus had ultimately found the shotgun. He pointed at it and remarked, Oh, that's where the shotgun was found? Yeah, I never would have seen that. Never got close to there. From what Deputy Harmson remembered, while processing the crime scene that night, he had never had a reason to be over where Titus said the gun had been. Which means the only search that would have turned up the weapon, had it been where Titus found it, is the one that was done the next morning, in daylight. That job fell to deputies Tom Sharp and Russ Richards, who'd stayed out at the game area overnight to keep watching the crime scene. Because in the morning, what we were going to do is do a grid search. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know what grid search is? Yeah. Okay. When daylight broke, Sharp and Richards began their grid search, scouring the area around the crime scene for the missing shotgun. And as deputy Russ Richards remembers it, he and Sharp combed through the entirety of the patch of woods where the bodies had been found. We used basically... Markers that we could see, you know, whether it be trees, uh, posts, whatever, mm-hmm. and three feet apart, back and forth, because we were looking for the one shotgun. Mm-hmm. And I can honestly say, without any doubt whatsoever, there was no shotgun to be found anywhere in that area. If there was a stick, bottom line is, 
you reach down, you move it to make sure it's a stick in that shotgun because if there's leaves on top of just part of a barrel or something. Uh, and after we went east-west, then we went north-south so that basically, you know, there was, we wanted to remove any, mm -hmm. if there was any uncertainty, it's like, no, we covered the whole thing thoroughly. There was absolutely no gun. As Deputy Russ Richards remembers it, and as he testified at Titus's trial, the grid search that he and Detective Sharp had done the morning after the murders was thorough, and it included a search of the specific location where 24 hours later, Titus would report that he had found the shotgun. And if that's the case, and the shotgun was not there at the time of their search, well that would mean that someone had taken the gun from the scene and then brought it back later. And because Jeff Titus is the one who found it, well he's the one who must have brought it back. But cold case team detective Rich Madison thinks there's a simpler explanation for why Jeff Titus succeeded in finding the gun when both Richards and Sharp had been unable to do so. But it, it was found further away than what they said in the report of the ground they covered. And could have been there the whole time, and nobody found it. In the police report he'd written to document their search efforts that morning, Deputy Sharp had been very specific. The grid search had been done in a 50 to 60 foot radius out from the crime scene. But the place where Jeff Titus found the shotgun was 125 feet away from the crime scene. And actually, as we'll get into more later, it was even further than that. But for now, let's call it 125 feet. Because 125 feet is obviously quite a bit more than 50 or 60 feet. If Deputy Sharp's report is accurate, then the grid search that was done the morning after the murders would not have included the area where the gun was ultimately found by Jeff Titus. And that would mean there's no reason to believe the gun had ever been removed from the game area in the first place. That's the conclusion the original investigators, Detective Bruce Wersima and Detective Roy Ballack came to as well. Yeah, so anyway, we don't feel that they would have found that gun at that time. At Titus's trial, Sharp and Richards testified that they'd done a grid search of the entire section of forest back there. In fact, they told the jury, they'd specifically searched the spot where the gun was found. Which is why Deputy Richards was able to testify that he could, quote, positively say without doubt that gun was not there the next morning. He stands by that today. One of the reports says that the search was like 60 feet wide or something. Yeah, you know, it was, like I said, we went from the edge of the field, mm -hmm. in all the way back to the swamp, from Titus's property, well beyond the area uh, uh, where the bodies were. So you think that the the numbers in the report probably aren't accurate? As far as a if it's a sixty feet, if it's a sixty feet, that's well, that's that's going to be short. Okay. So maybe Deputy Sharp's report was mistaken about the size of the area that he and Deputy Richards actually did search, or maybe it's not. There's no way now, anyway, to conclusively prove it one way or the other. But still, the report says there, in black and white, that the deputies only searched an area that went about 50 to 60 feet from the bodies. This seems like it would be pretty good evidence for Jeff Titus. At the very least, it raises doubts about whether the shotgun really would have been found by the deputies' search. If you're a defense attorney, it really seems like the kind of thing that you'd want to raise at trial. But Titus's attorneys never did. The jury never heard about it. So, one way or the other, the deputies did not find Doug Estes' missing shotgun. How then did Jeff Titus end up finding it? I was walking, checking my traps, because I still had box sets out, even though it's, like I say, it's deer season, you got to get them early. And, uh, but I went out and checked them, and I walked over to where the area had been cordoned off for the crime scene or whatever. I mean, I know people were back in there hunting, because I'd seen people the next night or whatever, the night before seen somebody and uh i walked over there and was walking to go down to where the i suspected the crime scene was and uh here was a shotgun laying there next to a tree limb i never touched it i turned around and went up to the house and i called the sheriff's department i said are you missing a gun from the shooting the other night out here at the Fulton state game area why are you at so well i just found the gun in the woods 
and they said, well, we'll send somebody else to talk to you. And then I went back with my camera to a picture of it in case it turned up missing or whatever while well, I went back up and waited for the deputies to come. It wasn't just the sheriff's department that Jeff Titus called, though. He also called the local newspaper, the Kalamazoo Gazette. Actually, as some of the original detectives remember it, it was only the Gazette that Jeff Titus had called. The Gazette, in turn, had called them and alerted them to the fact that someone had found a gun. It just makes you want him to be guilty, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, really. He's not doing himself any favors. He's not doing himself any favors throughout this whole thing, especially at work. Jeff Titus has always claimed that he called the police before he called the Gazette, though the police themselves remember it this way. But Jeff doesn't deny making the call to the paper. How do you explain it? Um, can't explain it. I really can't. I mean, you know, it, it could have been just, you know, like that. But like I said, I turned around and called them. And for my reasoning, you know, I just did it name in the paper, whatever, you know, turn around and find something for the crime scene. Jeff Titus got more than just his name in the paper. The article about how he'd found the missing gun had been run on the front page of the newspaper's metro section, with his photo right there beside the headline. Still, while Detective Worsama found Jeff Titus' behavior in calling the Kalamazoo Gazette to be suspicious, the fact that Jeff had found the shotgun when the deputies hadn't wasn't something that seemed odd or surprising to him. To Worsama, it seemed like the gun would have been easy to miss. I, I just remember he said, yeah, that, there it is. And I was looking and I couldn't even see it. And he's pointing to it. And I go up there and I see, and then I do see, yeah, what looks to be a shotgun laying next to the branch, the limb, and leaves and stuff, okay. The police took several photographs of the shotgun including several photographs of Jeff Titus pointing to it on the forest floor. Of course, Johnson was suspicious as well, because what's this guy doing, you know? So he took a picture of him, Jeff, pointing at it, just to have a record of that. The photos show that leaves had blown over the shotgun, partially obscuring it. But it doesn't look as if it had been purposely hidden from view. It's just that on a forest floor full of black and brown sticks, the black and brown gun was well camouflaged. When Jacinda and Susan walked back to the crime scene with Ron Elwell, the neighbor who had first gone back to the crime scene, they looked through the photos while trying to locate the spot where Jeff had originally found the gun. But even in the photos that are focused and centered on the shotgun, it's not something that immediately jumps out at you. Yeah, you can see the, this is this tree right here that we're next to. Um, and it's facing a different angle, but yeah. But, you can see the gun, right? Uh, it's, it's somewhere in there. It's hard so to see. It. Isn't that the gun right there? No, I think it's locked. Oh no, where is the gun? Well, Oops. that's a good. You don't need uh, to see that. Uh, right there's your good indicator of how hard it. Like, there it is. There it is. <laughs> oh my God. I Three mean, of one, us and we couldn't <laughs> see it. One evening back here of, and a little bit of wind would easily cover. Not everyone agrees the shotgun would have been difficult to find, though. Some people think the shotgun should have been completely obvious to anyone walking back there. And Jeff Titus is one of them. The, the cold case detectives work him up when, you know, he says, well, you know, only the killer would have found the gun. I, I don't go along with that. If the gun was laying there, like I say, anybody could have found it that would have walked by it. If the case against Jeff Titus had been solely based on him finding the missing shotgun, I don't think he would have ended up being charged in this case, let alone convicted. There's just too much uncertainty there. Even if you think that the search done by Deputies Sharp and Richards would have most likely turned up the gun, you have to at least allow for the possibility that they simply didn't find it. Maybe they overlooked it there in the leaves, or maybe they didn't search quite the right area. But there was something else notable about the shotgun that Jeff had found. It had no fingerprints on it. Not a single one. And as a juror from his trial recalls, it was this lack of fingerprints that was the truly damning evidence against Jeff Titus. Do you remember anything about the prosecution's case that was comp particularly compelling or stood out to you? The gun. Uh, they brought up the gun, and the defense 
And it was kind of you know, a combination of uh, prosecution and defense. The, the gun was found by Titus, mm-hmm. and he cleans it. He's supposed to have a criminal justice background, and he cleans this gun instead of taking it. And he cleans everything. He cleans the ammunition that was in it. He cleans uh, the gun inside and out. There's no fingerprints. There's no nothing. Uh, and then he says, oh, I found this just laying here. Mm-hmm. And he makes a mockery of the deputies who were looking for it and couldn't find it. Jeff Titus's prints were not found in the shotgun, but neither were Doug Estes's fingerprints, and it was his gun. Did that seem strange to you? It kind of suggests that it was wiped clean, but even Marty Johnson said, well, you know, the fall of the year, if somebody's got gloves on, they could have put prints, but then in handling it, they could have wiped them off as well. Doug Estes had been wearing gloves in the day that he was killed. He still has them on in the crime scene photos. They're big, thick gloves. He'd have to take them off when he loitered his gun back at the parking area off of X Avenue. Then again, Jim Bennett had been wearing gloves too, and there had been fingerprints found in his muzzle loader. Three of them, in fact. Two of them had been Jim Bennett's own prints, though the third was never identified. Some of the Cold Keys team also thought the lack of any pitting or rust on Doug's Mossberg was another sign that the gun had not been in the woods between the time of the murders and when Jeff Titus found it. But although it was clean, in the sense that there were no prints or rust, the gun hadn't been spotless. There was dirt in it, especially around the muzzle. Actually, there was quite a lot of dirt inside the muzzle too. But the thing of it was, there was a, a plug about two, two or three inches deep which kind of suggests to me that somebody threw it in, either tomahawked or just, and it went end over end, and the barrel hit first. You know, impacted the dirt. Dirt is forced in the barrel, then it flops over. Detective Mike Brown agrees with Madison's theory about the shotgun being tossed back into the woods. But to Detective Brown... The dirt at the end of the shotgun's barrel had just been another attempt by Titus to stage the scene. And the thing of it is, he cleaned that damn gun up so good. Well, he didn't clean the tip out. The tip was still full of dirt. No, no, that's where he threw it in there. Oh, when he threw it back? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's not going to clean that out. He wants to, people to think, I mean, it's, he, didn't, he didn't clean it all up and then walk it back in there. He threw it in there. Like a javelin? Yeah, yeah. But the, even the owner's prints were not on that weapon. I mean, come on. Mike Brown believes that Titus had touched and maybe even used Doug's shotgun in the course of committing the murders. And then, fearing that he might have left fingerprints behind, he'd been forced to take the gun with him in order to clean it off. That Titus would have been so evidence conscious about possible fingerprints left in the shotgun seems kind of strange, though, because Detective Brown's theory is also that Titus went through Jim Bennett's wallet and looked through the cards there before tossing them all over the place. Why worry about taking the shotgun home to wipe it down when you've already risked leaving prints on dozens of pieces of paper and plastic? In fact, a number of fingerprints were found on the cards from Bennett's wallet. Some of them were identified as belonging to either Bennett or to other people who had good reason to have their prints found there, but there were at least three prints that, to this day, have never been identified. It seems like someone might have left prints there at the scene. Those prints were not Jeff Titus's, by the way. They checked for that. Anyway, if Mike Brown is right about Jeff Titus taking the time to stage the crime scene, and making the gun look dirty on purpose in order to trick people into thinking the gun hadn't been cleaned at all, well, it seems like it didn't take long at all for Jeff Titus to screw that whole plan up. When the cold case team reopened the Fulton game area, their first big breakthrough came after Detective Mike Brown realized there was a pool of potential witnesses that had never been thoroughly explored. Jeff Titus's old co-workers. 
I worked the streets, you know, I worked, uh, I interviewed all the nurse. I spent maybe a month and a half, two months out at the VA hospital. That's where Titus worked. Mm -hmm. I got to know his fellow workers, his security people, his chief. I got to know his all the nurses he flirted with every night. I got to know everybody out there. I talked to the National Guard, the people that he was in the guard with. They said he's a crazy son of a bitch. Mike Brown's work paid off. The cold case team interviewed and re-interviewed dozens of Jeff Titus's co-workers from the Veterans Affairs Hospital in Battle Creek, where years before, Jeff had worked as a security guard. At the time of the cold case investigation, Jeff hadn't worked at the VA for close to a decade, but many of his old co-workers still remembered him, and remembered him telling them things about the shotgun that he'd found. So I um, I told you I talked to Workama again, some of the... Right. And he, they had some questions they want me to ask you. Workama uh, or Weersma? Workama, the cold case detective. Yeah. He said, ask Jeff, why did you tell people you took the gun home? Why did you tell some people you I took... I didn't say that. I didn't say that. People hear what they want to hear. Because I could say something to you and it goes to the next person and it totally changes. If Jeff Titus was going around making confessions to his co-workers about the gun he found, then he was doing so by telling just about every single one of them a different version of how it had happened. Their statements about their past conversations with Jeff varied wildly. For example, one former co-worker testified about two or three years after the murders that Jeff Titus had told her that he'd found the bodies of the two hunters and the gun, and that he'd taken the shotgun with him when he immediately went back to his house to call the police and tell them about the bodies. Another co-worker with a different version of the story told detectives that he'd heard Jeff telling people at the VA, quote, someone had called him and told him the weapon was still back there. So Jeff Titus said he'd gone back into the woods to look for the gun, found it, took it home, and then called the police. And another story from yet another co-worker had Jeff going back into the game area to search for the gun once he learned the police couldn't find the missing weapon. And when he found it, he kept it a few days in order to, quote, play a game with the sheriff's department. The co-worker who told the police about this version of Jeff's story said that Jeff Titus told him he cleaned the gun but explained that it had not been for any malicious reason. Rather, it was because he's the kind of guy that appreciates the firearms, and since that gun had been rusted from sitting out for two nights, he wanted to get it back in good condition. Jeff Titus, for his part, denies ever having made any of these statements to his co-workers. Yes, he talked about finding the gun at work. After all, his picture had been in the paper for it. It wasn't surprising that it came up in conversation, but Jeff maintains he never told any of the co-workers the things that they testified to at trial. But even Detective Worsama, who believes Jeff Titus is innocent, has obvious reservations about whether he's telling the truth about how he found the gun. I can't answer to the fact that somehow Jeff had possibly removed that weapon, took it home, maybe cleaned it, somehow decided to bring it back. I don't know. I haven't got those answers. I know there's answers there, but uh, to this point, I don't have them. If Jeff Titus is telling the truth, if he really didn't touch the gun and really didn't tell any of his co-workers that he'd taken it home and cleaned it, it's hard to understand how so many of his co-workers ended up coming forward to tell the police that yes, in fact, he had said those things. Why would all of them have made up such a story? gets me though Jeff is there are so many people and I I know that a lot of people are saying things that aren't true and people are saying stuff that you never said but a lot of people are saying that you told them you found the gun and took it home overnight and those statements I can't disprove what they're saying is what I said to what Big Jack said somebody in Athens found the gun he took it home when he found out about the murders he took it back that's what I said this is the Big Jack story. It's one of Jeff Titus's explanations for why there are so many stories going around about how he supposedly took the shotgun home, but then brought it back to the crime scene later. Those stories hadn't been about him, he says. 
they'd been about an entirely different story told by a different VA coworker who'd heard that some unidentified person had taken the gun home, but then had taken it back again. And that's when Jeff Titus had found it. Though, by the way, the Big Jack story is also an implicit acknowledgement by Jeff Titus that he had gone around talking to his VA co-workers about how he found the gun. Because the origin of the Big Jack story is this. One day at work, a few months after the murders, Jeff had been talking again to his co-worker Big Jack about how he'd found the missing shotgun. But this time, Big Jack told him, Hey, you should stop bragging about that. You finding the gun had nothing to do with you being good at finding things. When Jack turned around and told me, he said, Jeff, the only reason you found it is because somebody else found it. And then they, when they heard about the murders, they took it back. But he would never tell me who. That story seems so crazy to me, because why would someone take the gun back? Yeah, I mean, really. Then me, I'd have thrown it out in the swamp or someplace where it would never been found. According to Jeff, this whole Big Jack story wasn't told to him until a while after the murders. Long enough that, by then, Titus had already been cleared as a suspect by the original detectives. So investigators never heard about the Big Jack story until 2001, when the cold case team talked to some of Titus's friends, and they told them about it. One of those friends was Stan Driscoll, Jeff Titus's hunting companion and alibi witness. He created a story that I never understood, because it makes no sense. He said that he knew a man, Big Jack, somebody or other, I don't know his last name, knew somebody from Athens who had found the gun, taken it home, cleaned it, and returned it to the, 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 the murder scene. And that is the gun that he claims he found. And that made, given my logic, that made no sense to me. Uh, the police said it made no sense to them. Stan Driscoll had been troubled by Jeff's story about Big Jack. He was so troubled by it that when the cold case detectives came to him with a request and asked for his help in investigating his friend, Stan hadn't told them no. Would I be willing to be taped, recorded by telephone call to Jeff to see if we could get some story out of him dealing with that and whether he might have had something to do with this crime or not? So I literally at that stage allowed the police to tape my call to Jeff to try and find that out. Stan had plugged a recorder into his phone, called Jeff up, and asked him about that shotgun he'd found a decade before. On that tape call, Jeff had told him the Big Jack story once again. The cold case team immediately took that tape and played it for Big Jack Warren so that he could hear what his buddy Jeff had been saying about him. They taped him, he carried a tape for him, and Jeff was called up on the phone and he, the guy asked him about something that involved me and uh, Jeff said yes. Jack's the one that told me about the weapon that was missing for a period of time, how to find it. That was a falsehood. That wasn't true, you know. And I told him there's no way in Hades that I would have anything to do with anything like that. So, do I believe that Jeff Titus is telling the truth about the missing shotgun and how he came to find it? I've swung back and forth in this question more times than I can count. And in trying to make sense of the mess of evidence around it, I always ended up feeling like I was trying to solve a jigsaw puzzle the same way I'd solved them as a kid, by smushing in the little cardboard edges and wiggling them around until they finally jammed in together. Sure, the method works. It's one way of putting a puzzle together. Just don't act too surprised when the resulting picture doesn't make a whole lot of sense. On some days, I had no problem believing there's no mystery here at all. The deputies had simply missed the shotgun when they'd done their search, and then Jeff had found it. The end. Nothing more complicated than that. But then on other days, I'd be pondering parts of the case that just didn't make any sense. Things like the Big Jack story. And I'd go back to questioning again whether the shotgun really had been there in the game area all along, and whether Jeff was telling the truth about it. 
And then there was a day that Jacinda and I had discovered something new about the missing shotgun. And thinking I'd understood what the evidence had meant, I'd walked away no longer questioning if Jeff Titus was lying, and instead feeling utterly certain that he was. Ideally, he'll just fucking admit it. He's never gonna admit it. Really? Mm-hmm. I'll talk to the attorney. Never admit it. Really? I don't think so. I think he's been advised not to at some point, or he thinks it'll look bad for him, or... I mean, sure, but it, it already look looks bad. bad. <laughs> All right, how much worse can it get? Like, like you're freaking in prison for the rest of your life. No, like, we need the fucking truth. Oh. At this point, like, it doesn't matter how bad it is. The only thing can help him is the truth. Maybe it won't help him, but anything short of that, it certainly won't. I had come to believe that Jeff Titus' story about the missing shotgun was a lie for... All of the same reasons, and then some, that Jeff Titus's friend Stan Driscoll had always thought it was a lie as well. This is weird. Dealing with that episode, I actually was willing to say Jeff might have done this because the police were saying, you know, we have this kind of evidence, we have this stuff that is suggestive. And being what I am, had he committed the murder, fine, he should go to prison. I didn't think finding the shotgun made Jeff a murderer. I didn't even think Jeff lying about how he found the shotgun made him a murderer, though that would certainly be troubling. But the lie itself, if it was a lie, seemed almost understandable. Maybe Jeff Titus's story had been mostly true. Maybe, like he said, he'd been walking his property line and spotted the shotgun lying there. But, like a magpie finding something shiny, the strange gun had been a temptation he'd been unable to resist. Maybe he had touched it. Maybe he'd even taken the shotgun home, like his co-workers at the VA had said. Only later, after he'd gotten to thinking about it, he'd realized that maybe he hadn't found some magic shotgun that had been dropped off by the firearms fairy, and realized that maybe instead it had belonged to a murder victim, and was crucial evidence in a double homicide case. And so he'd try to fix things by taking it back. That's how Stan Driscoll eventually made peace with the Big Jack story. He didn't believe it, but he didn't believe it made Jeff Titus guilty either. If he is the one that actually found it and took it and returned to the crime scene, it would not have been done for, as a trophy. He would have done it because he liked guns. He wanted as many guns as he could get his hands on. And if he actually originally found it, took it home and cleaned it, and then brought it back, not because it's a trophy, it was because it was a gun and he wanted guns. So that would have been his motivation had he been the person who found it, took it away and brought it back. And it probably had been found and taken away and brought back because my understanding is the outside of it was clean, clear of fingerprints. And that means somebody did something to it to remove suspicion of something. As for Big Jack Warren, well, despite being the Big Jack story unwilling subject, And despite his confusion about why Jeff Titus would have said something like that about him, it didn't cause Big Jack to doubt Jeff's innocence. So what did you think when you heard this tape of Jeff and them talking about... I laughed. (laughs) And I thought, I said, you know, it's not true what he's saying. I don't know why he's saying it. I mean, he's implicating me in something that I'm not guilty of. But I don't know what Jeff was thinking at the time. Mm-hmm. But to get them off him, him is all I could think about. And then I don't, I don't hold up against Jeff. So you haven't talked to Jeff really since all this happened? No. You haven't talked to The last to time I talked to Jeff was at the trial, and I told him hello. I know I mean, you're not supposed to kind of do the guess that stuff. But I did, you know, I did consider him a friend. Uh, I still consider him a friend. But why he did the tape deal, I don't know. I'm sure at the time he didn't know he was being taped. I can appreciate Big Jack Warren's stoic agnosticism towards the question of why Jeff Titus has said the things he said about the missing shotgun. But it's not an approach I can share. 
if Jeff Titus was telling some kind of little white lie about what happened to the gun, and I thought there was good evidence to suggest that yeah, he was, well, I needed to know that. Because nothing else was adding up. It got to a point where I think I almost wanted Jeff to be lying. It would have made my life much easier anyway if he'd only just admit that he hadn't been telling the whole truth about this one little thing. Maybe then, things in this case might start making sense. You don't think there's any chance that you found the gun Sunday night and waited till Monday no, to call it in? No, it was Monday morning. Yeah. Because as soon as I found it, I went back up to the house and called the sheriff's department. Yeah. So one thing I've wondered is if, because of the trial, because of everything, it's, is, it, is it possible that you feel like you've gotten stuck in the story? Have I got what? That you've gotten stuck in the story and can't change it now because of everything that's happened. I can't change it because I'm telling what I, what I know. I found the gun Monday morning. I hadn't believed Jeff then. I thought I'd known that he was wrong. But that was before I learned that there were more things in Kalamazoo County than my theory of the case could have dreamed of. That's all for episode four of Undisclosed, The State vs. Jeff Titus. We'll be off next week for Thanksgiving, but we'll be back with episode five on Monday, November 30th. And before that, we'll be back this Thursday with our addendum to discuss both this episode of Undisclosed and also the most recent episode of Killer in Question on the case of Thomas Francisco. And don't forget to send us your questions on social media with hashtag UD addendum. And Mithil Telhan is our executive producer. Our logo was designed by Baluki, and our theme music is by Ramiro Marquez. Audio production was done by Rebecca Lavoie of Partners in Crime Media and host of the Crime Writers on podcast. And music from this episode is by Blue Dot Sessions. Transcripts for episodes are available on our website at undisclosed-podcast.com. They're brought to you by our amazing transcript team, Dom Logos, Britta Bliss, Skylar Park, and Erica Fladell. And of course, thank you to our sponsors for making it possible for us to come back week after week. You can follow us online, and on all social media, our handle is at UndisclosedPod. We're at Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And if any of our listeners out there have information on Jeff Titus' case that they'd like to share, we'd love to hear from you. You can reach us at undisclosedpodcast at gmail.com, or you can call and leave a message at 410-205-5563. That's all for this week, and thanks so much for listening. <laughs>